Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our virtual seminar. Uh, it's, the title is Strategies and Operational Guidelines for the Ethics Review and Oversight of COVID-19 Related Research. I am Carla Sainz. I am uh, the Regional Bioethics Advisor at the Pan American Health Organization's Department of Health Systems and Service. Services. I'm responsible for a regional program of bioethics on, on bioethics of the organization. I'm very happy to be today with you and I'm happy to be able to introduce my two colleagues with which we've developed these documents that will be presented today and of which they are co authors. I'm um, referring to Dr. Sara Carracedo from Peru and Dr. Ana Palmero from Argentina. Dr. Sara, Sara Carracedo is a lawyer. She has a master's in bioethics uh, from the University of Monash, which is WHO's collaborating center for bioethics. She has uh, um, spent a, a, a period of time getting further specialized on research ethics at the NIH Department of Bioethics. Uh, she works at the uh, office, uh, a general office of research and technological transfer of Peru's National Institutes of Health that is the entity that oversights uh, ethical research in the country. Uh, and Dr. Ana Palmero is also trained as a lawyer and she specializes in bioethics. She works at the Directorate for uh, Research in the Ministry of Health of Argentina. And she's a member of the Ethics Review Committee of Doctors Without Borders and also a, a, a member of the steering committee of the Global Forum on Bio, Bioethics in Research. So we, um, as it turns out, Dr. Sara Carracero will not be able to join us today, uh, but I will be presenting on her behalf. So we, uh, we will be presenting the two recent documents of PAHO's regional program on on bioethics that supplement this initial ethics guidance on COVID-related research that you may have seen. So these two documents, and my apologies because the images are in, um, the covers are in Spanish and not in English, uh, the, the, docu the titles in English are Guidance and Strategies to Streamline Ethics Review and Oversight of COVID-19 Related Research. And the second one is template and operational guidance for the ethics review and oversight of COVID-19 related research. Uh, I want to acknowledge that these two documents have been developed in order to, to uh, provide guidance to our member states, to the several uh, uh, ethics review committees and national health authorities of, our, of the Americas. But they have also been, their development has been importantly informed by uh, uh, the discussions with, uh, with the countries, with the different health authorities, and you will see that later in the discussion. Um, and I want to also acknowledge that this is a um, collaborative, and sorry, this work has been funded by the Wellcome Trust that also funded PAHO's previous work on ethics guidance for Zika. We are recording this session and the recording will be available at PAHO's virtual campus for public health and also uh, on our website and disseminated through the network of the, Panamer of the regional program on bioethics of PAHO in order to receive it and receive other um, other uh, resources and information about research ethics, we invite you to subscribe to our list uh, to our list public um, research ethics. Oops, somehow I'm not being able to move to the next slide. There we go. Okay, so before we start, I, um, as I said, I will be presented, presenting on behalf of Dr. Sara Caracedo, and then I'll be followed by Dr. Ana Palmero. I just want to clarify uh, one, uh, a couple of rules. If you have questions, we, we do welcome your questions. We want to know what is it that you're finding challenging and how to best support you. We welcome the, the questions through the chat and please make sure they're sent, they're sent to everybody. And um, 
And if you have any technical difficulty with the platform, with the WebEx, please, please send your question also to the chat, but directly just to the host. So, um, and now we go. So, um, we've been working at, uh, at PAHO on strengthening ethics preparedness from emergencies. And this is a task that God, uh, um, that when our member states convened in 2018 and reviewed the progress on bioethics, it was decided that that was a task that we needed to put more work on. We needed to strengthen our ethics preparedness for emergencies. Specifically in the context of research, that implies uh, enhancing our capacity to conduct research ethics rapidly in the context of an emergency or disaster. And uh, we've been working on that, and, and um, we were lucky to have uh, several pieces of guidance that are helpful for to to figure out what uh, when research is ethically is, is ethical uh, during pers during emergencies, and I'm referring mostly to research with human participants. We have WHO's guidance for managing ethical issues in infectious disease outbreaks. We have SEOMS International Ethical Guidelines for Health-Related Research Involving Humans. And uh, keep in mind that Guideline 20 is uh, specifically uh, uh, for emergencies. We have the recent production, was published in January, of the National Council on Bioethics, titled is Research in Global Health Emergencies, Ethical Issues. And the first, the very first document that I mentioned, uh, uh, Pahos Ethics Guidance on Issues Raised by the Nobel uh, coronavirus disease pandemic also provides answers to some issues on that that we uh, will learn continue to be a uh, uh, difficult. For example, waiver of consent, broad consent, what needs ethics review, and so forth. So we have highlighted, as we highlighted in the context of Zika that we have a moral imperative to catalyze ethical COVID-19 related research during the pandemic. Part of the reason why this pandemic is so, uh, uh, we find ourselves in such a devastating situation is because we do not have uh, safe and effective therapeutics or vaccines. In order to produce the, those, we must conduct research and that research must always be done ethically. So, but how, how do we catalyze this ethical research? It may be difficult. We face some challenges. So the challenge of generating that knowledge rapidly to be able to respond to the pandemic. The challenge to make sure, even in this difficult situation, that this, the research is conducted, that, that is conducted is scientifically valid and will produce results that are general, generalizable the challenge to make sure that that research done in a hurry is still ethical. And uh, the challenge to reduce the various practical obstacles that we encounter when we conduct research. We don't have time for that. We need to do things fast, but we, knew, we need to do things well. And how do we achieve that? We always talk about what we need to do. And what we fought for this project is to go from the what we Got, we ought to do to the, how we have to do it. So that's why we uh, produced these documents with my colleagues uh, Anna and Sarah that have such practical approach. How do we? How can we ensure rapid and ethical research? First, we must adapt the procedures that we have. By that I mean general or general procedures are, are SOPs. We need to establish alternative and flexible mechanisms and procedure for rapid ethics review and oversight. We cannot do business as usual. We cannot wait till, oh yeah, our meeting next month and then we'll discuss the, this COVID-19 study. We need to do things differently. We need to avoid every duplication of efforts. So that means that we need to coordinate and come up, a plan, come up with a plan. So we have procedures for streamlined review of multi-center uh, uh, studies uh, that that enable like having just one review. So we have to make sure that we do 
that we don't have several committees reviewing the same, um, the same study. Then we have to uh, ensure that there's communication and cooperation. We need to ha have procedures to enable efficient communication, harmonization of criteria, and also cooperation between ethics, uh, research ethics committees and health authorities. Remember, we're in a hurry because we need to act quickly, and we will only get to act quickly and we if we have quick methods to share the results of the study with the relevant authorities. Uh, last but not least, we need uh, coordination with regulatory authorities. We need procedures to ensure that the ethics review committee that's reviewing the study and the national regulatory authorities that, that oversee uh, uh, drugs and devices are coordinated. And ideally, we think that the reviews of both entities should be conducted simultaneously as opposed to one after the other one. And in order to do these things, in order to adapt procedures, avoid duplication of efforts, ensure communication and cooperation and coordination with the regulatory authorities, there is not one single way of doing it. There are several ways of achieving this goal. And, uh, and what we're trying to do in our first document is to explain what needs to be done and how to do it. But in what we're doing is we're presenting, as it were, a menu of options, a menu of strategies so that every country, every region, every setting, uh, every province can figure out what is the best way to proceed. So we've, have, we've identified five strategies that we're presenting today, and they are not presented in an order that uh, indicates any preference of one over the other one. So um, these are five strategies, and, and you will see there's a level of variability within each strategy. And uh, some countries are opting for some, some countries are opting for others. And what we want to do is to explain what each of these uh, um, implies so you can choose what's best for your setting. So the first strategy is to come up with an ad hoc committee to review COVID. 19 related research. The other one is to task a national a committee at a national level to do all that relevant review. The third one is to est establish or appoint an existing sub regional extraterritorial committee to review that research. The fourth one is to designate a provincial or sub national committee for that job. And the fifth one is to uh, um, to have the institutional level committees um, do the, uh, the ethics review of COVID-19 related research, but for which some things have to be different from the standard way in which we do this. So um, what is the, the first point, the first strategy is the cre creation of an, an, ad, ad, sorry, an ad hoc committee. So that means that uh, in, we will establish a new committee, a new research ethics committee to do the review of all or some uh, uh, COVID-19 related research. This new committee can uh, have different, uh, it, its competence can have different scopes. For example, a, a, an ad hoc research ethics committee for, for COVID research may, for example, be proposed for clinical trials only or for all the COVID-related research. And in this situation, when we're creating a new committee, we need to have the regular SOPs, the standard, you know, the standard operating procedures for like a committee, like any committee, and include the emergency SOPs. In case, uh, uh, if we decide to opt for a national level committee, uh, we need to, uh, the idea would be to designate the research ethics committee, an existing national national level research ethics committee, for example, Brazil CONEP, uh, or uh, uh, the, the research ethics committee of, of a national government entity, for example, in some countries they're discussing uh, uh, tasking the 
the committee of the Ministry of Health with a review of all the COVID-19 related research. Again, the scope of competence may be different. There are options. You can uh, task this national level committee with a review of all COVID-19 related research or with a subset of COVID-19 related research. And since it's an existing committee, it has uh, uh, existing SOPs, so you would just need to add the emergency procedures. Uh, it's, the situation is not that different with the sub-regional extraterritorial co committee, uh, but the idea would be that several states within the same area or geographic region either create a, a, a regional committee that will, uh, like an ad hoc committee that will review all the COVID-related research in this geographic region, or designate an existing research ethics committee. I'm thinking, just to give you an example, uh, a Caribbean Public Health Agency has a uh, has a uh, ethics review committee, and one option uh, could be, for example, for the Caribbean English-speaking Caribbean countries to appoint that committee as the one in charge of reviewing all the COVID-19 related research. Again, the same issue, but the scope of competence being di being uh, possibly different based on what's decided, and. Uh, and, and the same point about the SOPs. If it's a new uh, committee, a new sub -re regional, sub-regional, extraterritorial committee, you would need to pro produce standard SOPs, regular SOPs, and add the emergency SOPs. And if it's an existing uh, research ethics committee, uh, you would need to just add the emergency SOPs to the existing SOPs. We're, uh, we're also considering provincial or subnational committees as a possibility that, you know, in many um, federal countries, countries where, uh, um, uh, where the handling of health issues is delegated to the provincial level, they, it, it, it's reasonable to either create or, de create or designate an existing research ethics committee uh, based on the governmental organization of the country, again, the same differences in level of competence that we have this in, in scope of review, as it were, that we've discussed before apply. And if it's new, you add the emergency SOPs. And again, if it's existing, existing sorry, if it's if it's new, you produce SOPs for regular stuff and the emergency component. And if it's existing, an existing committee, you just add the emergency SOPs. So the last option that we have considered is uh, uh, conducting the ethics review of COVID-19 related research at the level of the institutional, uh, of the committees at the, of the institutions. And it is possible in, if you're for that scenario to designate one or several institutional uh, committees to conduct a review of COVID-19 related research. And you could make that selection based on the experience of the of the committee, whether the committee is uh, associated with an institution that will have lots of COVID-19 patients. Based on the research topic, say you can have the committee of a vaccine, of, of a, uh, uh, an institute that uh, is a vaccine a vaccine research institute to review all the vaccine related uh, of studies in the country and so forth. But there's one issue that we want to highlight. If all the existing institutional research ethics committees have to review COVID-19 related research, they have, um, they have to do it in a, um, in a way that differ, differs from the standard arrangement in the country. That is, it cannot be the case that every single committee reviews conduct all the research, all the review that was um, uh, conducted. It, it cannot be the case that every single committee does its own review of the study. So if we have the reviews being done at the institutional level, which is a perfectly fine option, we must ensure that those reviews are done quickly and rigorously, that there's no duplication, so that that you have only one committee, one, one review, um, one committee doing the review as opposed to 20 committees doing doing the, the reviews. 
And that implies that you have mechanisms of coordination and communication between the research ethics committee, such as reliance agreements, for example, so one committee does the review and the other institutions agree to accept the ethics review conducted by that committee instead of repeating the review themselves. So uh, these are the options and are a little bit modular as it, as it were. Uh, that we've identified in our discussions with the countries and our review of the literature. But we think that there may be some options that we have not considered yet, and we really invite you to share with us what, um, uh, what options you're considering, and also as, we, uh, uh, as things move forward, whether there was need to review the options that, that the, op the option that you selected. So I'm going to pass the baton to Ana Palmero to continue the presentation on the uh, research, ethics, uh, research ethics review committees and specifically the procedures to ensure rapid and good review. Everyone, I hope you're well, considering the circumstances. Um, okay, as Carla said, we need to conduct rigorous and ethical research and reduce practical obstacles in its conditions. So what should research ethics committee do? Whatever the strategy chosen by the authority for rapid review, committees need to adopt procedures to ensure rapid and rigorous ethics reviews and oversight of research. Uh, for this purpose, PAHO has released a second practical document. It's all template and operational guidance for the ethics review and oversight of COVID-19 related research, which provides guidance to develop standard operating procedures for rapid review. Uh, the document presents the key topics that must incorporate in the SOP, and these topics have been divided into three sections. Uh, the first one is the preparation of the committee, and the second is the, the ethics review process itself. And the third one is the ethics oversight. The information is divided in two columns. And in one column, we provide guidance on the specific issues. And in the other column, we illustrate this with a template that you can use or adapt to, to, your, to your own circumstances. Uh, Okay, for the preparation of the REC, in addition to the usual selection of members, it is important to include health professionals with knowledge relevant to COVID-19 and knowledge on ethical aspects of research in emergency situations. Uh, these aspects are addressed in the documents Carla had mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. It is possible that committee members may not be available to conduct rapid reviews because of their duties related to pandemic response. So it is important to pre-identify which members are available for rapid review before assigning them uh, a particular project. It is also important to pre-identify experts in topics related to the pandemic and their availability for rapid review and tight deadlines, and also identify possible conflict of interest they may have. Consultants may be called to serve as ad hoc committee members in the case that uh, regular members are not available, uh, giving them voice and, and vote. And it's very important to keep record of every communication, documents, and decisions of the committee, considering that all the, the communication will be through electronic means. The ASOPs uh, also must describe the responsibilities of the committee members, the researchers, and the secretary of the committee. The members must uh, commit to a rigorous review and compliance with deadlines and so. SOPs of, of the committee. The researchers must commit to adhere to ethical guidelines during the conduction of the research. 
Uh, it's very important that researchers are attentive to new evidence that could modify the study, and in case it is necessary to protect participants, researchers may modify the protocol, informing properly the community of the changes done. Researchers must have constant communication with the committee by telephone calls or WhatsApp or, or any instant messages. And the committee should be collaborative with researchers and commit to give response, uh, rapid response to, to any of, of their, their, uh, their questions. The secretary is in charge of a correct management and use of electronic resources for communication among members and also with researchers. Uh, every communication and document of the meetings and to keep records of all these electronic communications. Uh, for the ethics review process, the SOPs describe the processes and deadlines for rapid review considering the complexity of the project. There may be some projects that uh, need more time for uh, a rigorous review. And the submissions of requests for review, uh, initial review or additional review of, of reports is done also through electronic means. And if the committee doesn't have an electronic platform such as Prohito, uh, if, if the committee can use mails or instant messages uh, for, for this purpose. It is useful, it's useful to facilitate rapid review to ask researchers to submit additional information of the protocol, such as short summaries, uh, previous published evidence, the risk minimization plan to avoid contagion for participants and researchers, uh, also, the preliminary versions of agreements, NTAs, BTAs, and any other agreements between uh, researchers and funders. For multicenter studies, the committee can ask for previous reviews and also regulatory decisions. Uh, plans for post trial access uh, can also be submitted. And this information must not be seen as greater requirement for researchers. It is just information that the committee always reviews, but in an emergency scenario and tight deadline, to receive it in advance can facilitate the review. Uh, the SOPs must describe tight deadlines for rapid review, but considering the complexity of the project, in general, 24, 72 hours deadlines are considered for rapid reviews, but this is uh, uh, a consideration each committee must, must, must done. Additional review of reports on safety must also have tight deadlines. It is important to take into account new and rapidly evolving evidence that may modify the protocol at any time. Uh, the quorum can be lower than usual, taking into account that it is possible that members may be doing tasks related to the pandemic response. And all uh, meetings, uh, the committee must have virtual meetings. And if it is possible and necessary, the researcher can be invited to, to the meeting for clarification, for rapid clarification. It may happen that uh, members cannot attend a virtual, a virtual meeting because of their obligations during the pandemic. And uh, the, in these cases, deliberation and decision making can be conducted remotely by, by email or WhatsApp or any instant messages. And it, it is important to keep record of all the committee decisions through electronic or digitalized minutes using electronic um, signs. And communications to researchers must be done in a timely manner and if it's possible, immediately after the, the decision is, is made. What should 
the committee consider for, for decision making. Uh, re research during emergency must adhere to ethical standards, but carefully analysis needs to be done to what ethical considerations imply in the exceptional context of this emergency. The committees must keep context in mind because decision mechanisms to adhere to ethical principles may need to be adapted to this particular setting. For example, the process of informed consent may need to be adapted. We need to keep in mind the potential vulnerability of participants and also healthcare professionals, uh, the isolation of participants uh, with no familiar support, and existing protocols that may uh, impede the use of habitual uh, processes for obtaining informed consent. Committee must consider appropriate alternative mechanisms to guarantee the process and to avoid the risk of contention and the way uh, that the, they are going to register the process of informed content. Uh, for example, contact with patients can be done through videos or phone calls with the registry of consent through audiovisual means. Uh, and it's also very important to consider that research should not unduly interfere with healthcare delivery of affected populations. The third section of the document uh, regards to ethics oversight, which is extremely important during the emergency due to the new and rapid evidence that appears every day. So the SOPs must describe the processes for oversight to report on type deadlines and mechanisms for follow-up and monitoring of participants that might be deferred or conduct remotely. For example, contacting the participants when, when they are at home and when they are no more at the, at the hospital. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. And thank you, Carla, for this opportunity. Thank you so much, um, Anna. I'm going to give you a, a moment to write your questions or comments in the chat. Please send them to all panelists so we can all see them. And uh, while you do that, I just want to, as you were like, highlight the main topics. During the pandemic, we cannot do ethics review and oversight the same way we do this all the time. We must avoid applications. We must come up with strategies and procedures to do things quickly, but to do them well. And there is no simple formula. So um, we have to figure out what's the best option for our circumstance. And we've provided you with at least five, uh, um, five strategies. And for whichever strategy you uh, choose, uh, you must adjust your SOPs to the emergencies. And we have provided a, um, a template that you can, from which you can really copy and paste uh, and adjust uh, uh, to your circumstance. A final word about our, um, about, uh, uh, you may be wondering why we're not talking just about ethics review and we're talking about ethics review and oversight. We think that in the context of the pandemic, this is a crucial addition. We are in a situation in which uh, evidence evolves very rapidly. And what's ethical today may not be ethical tomorrow because we have new evidence, we have new knowledge, and the studies may have a different research, a, a different risk benefit profile, for example. So uh, that's why we added uh, um, the, the um, oversight to the uh, to the review and while um, one more th I want to um, highlight one more thing which is a PAHO's commitment to give you the necessary support during the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been working with many countries and we're trying to have in place some sort of I don't know, like a regional solidarity network. So we learn from each other. And as you very well know, this is not 
uh, we've been talking, the Ebola pandemic put uh, on the agenda the need to do rapid asset review during, during, during emergencies. But it's a topic on which we're figuring out things as we go because we don't have like a previous manual uh, on the topic. We have a literature is very brief, we ought to do this, and very little clarity about how. So we're trying to learn as we go, and we're committed to having an, uh, to doing an assessment of what worked, what didn't work, what could have been done better, in order to produce a comprehensive uh, guidance on both the strategies and the procedure and the you know, overall key topics uh, for rap uh, rapid ethics review and rigorous uh, oversight to during emergencies. And we're lucky to have uh, Welcome Trust uh, uh, funds to do that work. So I, um, I don't see any questions yet. I, wow, it must be really clear. Uh, and I don't know if you want to add anything else. I'll give you the mic. We have one question, Carla. Great. So Maria Cunio asked if the emergencies SOP sample are uh, available, and I am going to copy and paste them in um, in um, in English now, which I have them handy for the English session, but I. Um, uh, all attendees here. Uh, so those are the two public. Oh, oh my! No, they're in Spanish. I'm gonna copy and paste them and put them in English. Yes. So pretty much it's two documents. One is the one with the strategies and more general guidance, and the other one is um, uh, on the template and some clarifications. So you have like where you have some wiggle room, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna copy the um give you the links of the um of the english uh version uh there right now and i while we uh so welcome any other comments or questions from you I'm copying the, the links. Oh, okay, you were fine. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprising you. I think, uh, Gerard, uh, Gerard uh, if you have a question, can you please type it in the chat and uh, make sure it gets sent to all attendees? Oops, I, what I said was a little bit of a scramble. Sorry, I'm going to copy again. Just the, the, the um, link to the document with a template. Mm. So I don't know if uh, Gerald is uh, running a, a question or not, but I guess, it's, uh, and I don't know if you have anything to to highlight. There you go. That's, so that's the template. The documents are there. And uh, yeah, we invite you to subscribe to our, um, our uh, listserv. Uh, we, um, we have um, we have two lists: research ethics and public health ethics. Uh, there. So we have a question from Rosalinda. Please make sure when you send the questions that you send them to uh, all attendees. Uh, I'm not looking at the host site, so I may miss them. But uh, we got a question from Rosalinda Dominguez. 
if it is a multi-center study, is it preferable to obtain the research? The, the REC approval of the country where the study will take place in order to not uh, duplicate the evaluation of the study. We always recommend that the, that ASICS review approval is, conduct, is obtained in the country where the study is going to be conducted. And I, we think that's important because the capacity to take care of, of details that only those living in the country will be uh, uh, in the know is very important for rigorous ethics review. Having said that, we, do, we think what we need is one review in the country and not several. So to just give you an example from our region, our colleague Sarah Carracero has been working uh, with uh, uh, other folks in Peru to establish at an, an ad hoc committee that will review all the COVID-19 related research with human subjects. For example, the, they reviewed the WHO Solidarity pro Protocol that as far as I know will be conducted in 19 different sites in Peru. So the idea is that this ad hoc committee conduct one review at the country level for that study as opposed to having every single one of those 19 institutions conduct its own ethics review by their own committee. So I hope that clarifies the issue, but please uh, uh, feel free to, ex to, to expand on your question or indicate if that was not clear enough. I don't know, if, Anna, if you want uh, to add anything about the, the answer at this point. Uh, no, I, I agree with you. It is necessary to have a local revision of a review of the protocol. Yeah, there there are a number of of details that it would be uh, at best, I would say, even arrogant to expect to be able to to address uh, uh, from afar. Okay, so Rosalinda says that the topic is clear now, and I don't think we have any any other uh, uh, comment or question. So uh, we'll um, end our session then, uh, unless we receive something really quickly. And if you're typing now, please just say stop, question coming or something, so we don't uh, uh, cut the session too short. But thank you very much. Please feel free to email us to bioethics at if you have, uh, if you need further help. Uh, and, um, and also if you have figured out a strategy that we had not envisioned, or if you think that there's something in our template that needs to be added, uh, we're trying to put this, this uh, guidance for our member states and for all the other states that really, I mean, this is a pandemic, solidarity is the key value. So whomever benefits from this is welcome to use it. But we're trying to produce the help as soon as possible. And uh, we're learning about, uh, um, about this as we go. And we really welcome uh, any, uh, uh, any thought about something that could or should be expanded or should be important in the context of this emergency. Thank you very much for uh, being here today. Anna, anything to add on your end? No, it's okay, Carla. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. 